I am the PlayStation 4, and I will rule the living room. I am the Xbox One, and the living room shall belong to me. Let, Let battle, battle commence. commence. Excuse me, sorry I'm late. Coming through. Oh, it's nice here, isn't it? As the battle for games console supremacy heats up, this week Click checks out the new kid on the block. But will it make a good impression? HD, what was that again? We look at the stunning screens of the latest 4K TVs. But is there anything to watch on them? We'll also book an appointment with the dentist to see if new tech can lead to a better smile. All that plus the latest tech news and it's time for exercise. We'll get you fighting fit with sports apps in Webscape. Welcome to Click. I'm Spencer Kelly. A new generation of video games consoles is almost upon us. The Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 promise better graphics, improved multimedia features and of course more raw processing power. But Sony and Microsoft aren't the only players in the game. The battle for control of the living room is about to get dirty. Here's Mark Chislak. The battle has been raging since video recorders became popular in the 80s. Fast forward a couple of decades and for some companies, the space beneath the television could be regarded as the most valuable in most people's homes. It's a space that can accommodate satellite and cable TV boxes, video games consoles and PBRs. The list goes on. Despite claims to the contrary, it seems that content that comes out of the television still plays an important role in our living rooms. <laughs> oh, and now a new contender is about to slug it out with the plethora of boxes you can already plug into your television, vying for the affections of people that want to watch movies and play video games. Interestingly, it's not the brainchild of a consumer electronics company, but is being brought to us by a company which up until now has been most famous for writing and developing video games. First person puzzlers like the Portal games. Multiplayer shooters like the Team Fortress titles. And legendary first person action from Half-Life 1 and 2. I ask you what greater endeavour exists than that of collaboration. Say the word Valve to most fans of video games, and these are the titles which will spring to mind. As a games developer, Valve made its name with games which many regard as genre-defining. In 2003, the developer turned games distributor and content store when it launched its Steam platform for Windows, which in 2013 is now available for Linux PCs, Macs and PS3s. It's done something that Xbox and PlayStation would love to have a, a version of. Essentially, if you think about this as, a, as an iTunes for games, it's easy digital downloads um, over a secure, in a secure environment. Uh, 50 million active users already on there engaging, downloading these games. And if you think about bringing that to the, to the front room, it could be a very proud, powerful proposition. Speculation around Valve producing a physical device which plugs into a TV has been rife for some time. Valve has finally added substance to those rumours by making three announcements. The first, its intention to create a new Linux-based operating system, specifically optimised for playing games, called SteamOS. And as soon as Valve got our attention, it took the opportunity to announce its hardware plans. Plans that involve partnering with different tech companies to produce physical consoles which use the Steam operating system. We've already seen this happen in the smartphone world with Android. Put the manufacturing out to other people, try and instill some uh, base level standards so you get some consistency, but put those manufacturing costs on somebody else's bottom line and it gives you a chance to kind of focus on the branding and the development of the OS. Commanding a dominant position for the distribution of PC video games is one thing, but muscling in on the space beneath the TV, well, that is a challenge, especially for a company with very little experience in the development of actual hardware. 
So Valve has enlisted assistance from a company which has recently launched its own games device, the Shield handheld, graphics chip specialists NVIDIA. We work directly with, with Valve um, and Linux, which became SteamOS, uh, to improve the, the graphics performance as well as to uh, help Valve port uh, some of their games to Linux or to SteamOS. And the final part of the Steam puzzle Valve released are some images and specifications for a controller for its new range of home console devices. A controller that sports touchpads rather than analog control sticks. The touchpads will also be able to produce haptic feedback to the user, delivering physical sensations. Valve is inviting members of the public to test 300 prototype versions of its console with plans for finished production boxes to be produced by third-party manufacturers at some stage next year when we'll find out if the PC game specialist has what it takes to make it in the living room. Mark Chislak shoving even more boxes underneath his TV. Soon he won't have room for the TV itself. Anyway, next up, a look at this week's tech news. The FBI has shut down the underground black market website The Silk Road after a man suspected to be behind the outfit, Ross William Albrecht, aka Dread Pirate Roberts, was arrested. The website was notorious for providing a one-stop shop for drugs and other illicit items. Operating over the dark web, the site was only accessible using the Tor service, an anonymous web browsing system that hides the identity of its users. In the same bust, the FBI seized around $3.6 million worth of bitcoins. Google Glass might still be going through its testing phase, but it already has a rival. Called Aura, these augmented reality specs project data about the outside world onto an area in front of the wearer's eye. But here, the angles of the images that hang in the air can change depending on where you're looking. They're due to go on sale next year. Some users of Apple's new iOS 7 operating system are angry after a bug in the software's iMessage app left some unable to use the service. Apple has promised that it's working on a fix for the bug, which it says only affects a minority of users. Adding to Apple's headache, security researchers have discovered that iOS's voice assistant is a little loose-lipped. Siri allows those in the know to bypass the handset's lock screen and access some features. Finally, a team from the University of Southampton has shown how we might one day use a bolt of lightning to charge our phones or any other battery-powered device. It created a powerful electrical discharge to show off the robustness of its smoothing circuits. It's not clear if harnessing such extreme power will be possible or practical, but while we try, Nokia, which donated the phone, has warned the rest of us not to try this at home. Really? One of the new technologies we're seeing much more of this year is the next generation of television. Ultra high definition displays which sport about 4,000 pixels across the screen. Now these things have dropped in price recently to as low as 4,000 pounds. A snip, I know. But we do find ourselves asking that same question yet again. What on earth is there to watch on them? Well Dan Simmons has been looking at some of your options. Ultra high def TVs have been around for more than a year, but showing off your holiday snaps is still one of the prehistoric suggestions made by manufacturers to make use of one. So how can we brag about owning the very latest telly without looking like we've bought an oversized digital photo frame? Solution number one, get a 4K camera. This one costs, yes, you guessed it, about 4K in dollars. But at least you'll be able to view your filmmaking in ultra high def. Solution number two, stream YouTube's 4K channel. There's not a massive amount of choice, mainly movie trailers or short films littered with beauty shots designed to show off your new TV without necessarily entertaining you. <clears throat> without entertaining you. 
one way to get this up and running is by using a powerful computer to hook up to your telly. Both will need to have the latest version of HDMI, that's 2.0. That standard was only formalised last month, so your computer probably doesn't have it. 1.4 doesn't do a bad job, but it's not the full UHD experience. Solution number three, get Sony's Video Unlimited 4K download service. This box stores the movies and acts as a video player. You can download and play an unlimited number of ultra-high-def films with 70 titles to choose from. That's why they call it Video Unlimited. Oh, and it only works in the US. Note the emphasis on downloading before playing rather than simply streaming content. Big film services like Netflix don't plan to stream 4K for at least another 12 months and reckon we'll need a steady 15 megabits per second to do it. Hmm. Walking around the beautiful new 4K TVs at Europe's biggest consumer tech show last month, it sometimes seemed like the tech industry had forgotten that we actually might want to watch something other than, well, this. Confusion over connectors, concerns that our PCs simply aren't powerful enough to play back smoothly the huge files, that we don't have enough bandwidth to stream this kind of stuff over the web. They're all worries, but perhaps the solution we'd be most comfortable seeing is a souped up Blu-ray player. Well, that's not even being touted here, which means it's probably at least a year away. So, while we're waiting, solution number four, video games. A growing number are being produced for these screens, offering four times the resolution of existing HD. But they can only work through the PC platform, and even next-gen consoles like the PS4 and Xbox One are unlikely to be able to offer full UHD when they're launched next month. Full HD and, now... and so finally to solution number five, live ultra-high-def broadcasts. Okay, well this is a live test broadcast with content coming via satellite to this set-top box. So when will we see that in our homes? You can buy set-top boxes which are able to receive the signals probably at the end of the year 2014 and we will probably have some commercial services for broadcasters starting via satellite broadcasting UHD um, like 2015, maybe 2016 and we hope of course 2015. 2000 and when? So if we don't want to rely on these screens guessing what most of their pixels should look like, a process known as up smaller images, we'll just have to wait. While we are, you might like to test out the world's first 4K smartphone camera, out later this month. Best of luck getting the results onto your new telly, and don't shoot more than 10 minutes, or there may not be enough space to take any holiday snaps. You know us, we get excited about all kinds of technology, and that includes dental tech. Yes, you may laugh, but you've got a little something stuck just there, so there. The truth is, the latest consumer tech is getting more interesting, but can it really lead to cleaner, whiter gnashes, or is it all just a load of mouthwash? Lara Lewington has been finding out. A trip to the dentist. Not my idea of fun. Well, maybe you'd be able to spend less time here if you used one of these conscientiously. Well, electric toothbrushes are, of course, nothing new, but at the top end of the market, they have up their game. This may look like it's just a toothbrush sat in a glass, but actually, thanks to conduction technology, that's its charging unit. And if you want to charge it on the go, well, you just put it inside its travel case and this connects by a USB lead to your computer. Its vibrating mechanism helps it mix saliva with toothpaste hmm, to a consistency that should get between the teeth to provide a better clean. Whilst it may have timed clean, whitening, polishing, gum care and sensitive modes, when testing the device, I simply wanted it to clean my teeth to the best of its ability. 
As with any brush with a timer, it did encourage me to keep going for the full dentist recommended two minutes. But at 250 quid, you really are paying for a sleek design and choice of modes, which to me felt a bit novelty. If you're a sucker for a bit of monitoring, then this brush comes with a smart monitor to make sure you're cleaning each section of your mouth for long enough, plus a pressure sensor to check if you're brushing too hard. And if you're always in trouble with the hygienist for not flossing enough, well, even flossing's gone fancy. This air floss device sends short, sharp bursts of water or mouthwash in between each tooth. Or you could choose a flosser that may not be compact, but provides a more steady flow of water. Although until you've had a bit of practice, they can be rather messy. But can this sort of tech actually improve our dental health? Well, there's one way of finding out. Lara. Hello, Lara. Well, there are plenty of gadgets here that we can use at home, but how much difference can they really make to our dental hygiene? The main thing here is the technique we use, how long you brush for, and making sure you clean every tooth in your mouth. A lot of people are in and out in 30 seconds with a toothbrush, and that's really not sufficient to clean. So what we like about the electrics and why often we recommend them is because they often time you for two minutes to make sure you get the most thorough clean. The most important area to clean is where the gum meets the tooth. That's where we get the most buildup of plaque. So if you're using an electric, aim it into the gums and almost just hold the electric brush there. You don't need to do this kind of scrubbing because the brush will allow the right amount of force onto the tooth. And when it comes to the dreaded flossing, how does an electric flosser compare to good old fashioned flossing? I'd probably give it at about a five or six out of 10, if 10 is what you can do with floss. So why would anyone bother using an electric one? Because the brush is not going to get in between the teeth and you need something to clean in between the teeth. Flossing is a little bit technique sensitive, so you need to get good at it. That's obviously what we want to aim to be using, but if you're not going to use floss, better to use an electric flosser. And dental tech may be taking a whole new leap into the future. A prototype sensor's been developed that could monitor our dental hygiene and even report back on us to our dentist. Researchers at the National Taiwan University created this tiny sensor that can be embedded in an artificial tooth, or the user could have a smart tooth that can collect and monitor all oral activity, such as talking, <laughs> chewing, drinking, or coughing. <coughs> an accelerometer and Bluetooth transmitter allow that information to be sent to a smartphone. Its findings were 93.8% accurate, but you would need to be willing to have this piece of kit in your mouth, although a final version would be wireless. And just this week, a 3D printed toothbrush was announced. Looking more like a mouth guard, it would need to be custom made for each user. It may not look that inviting, but it does claim to reduce effective teeth cleaning time to just six seconds. By simply biting together and moving your teeth, it should do all the work that brushing and flossing would usually do, although not something I've personally had the chance to chew over yet. And there are plenty of apps helping us look after our dental health, some focused on diagnosis and advice, and others like Brush DJ, aiming to motivate better brushing. Using a chosen tune from your playlist, it takes you through your cleaning routine, encouraging you to brush to the beat if you like that sort of thing. But ultimately, the technology is only as good as the technique we use. But if we do it right, a trip to the dentist could be seen in a whole new light. Lara Lewington. Now, there will soon be 1.4 billion smartphones in the world. They keep us informed and connected. They link us to family and friends. They tell us where we are, and where we need to be. And thanks to a booming market in fitness apps, they now keep us alive and healthy too, as Kate Russell's been finding out in this week's Webscape. Most fitness experts agree around 10,000 steps a day is a good target for a healthy adult, and you can get your smartphone to track yours. 
Moves on the iPhone and Noom Walk on Android are both free and run in the background, logging various aspects of your activity. If you want to get serious about tracking your fitness, then one of these could be a good investment. It's estimated that the wearable electronics industry will be worth more than $8 billion by 2018. So, naturally, there are a lot of runners vying for market position, which means a lot of choice for us actual runners. So I decided to compare four of the leading fitness trackers, the Jawbone Up, Fitbit's Flex, the Nike Plus Fuel Band and the Misfit Shine. Keep on running. The Jawbone app has the most intuitive app. With straightforward data, it's easy to follow. You can set alarms and it logs your sleep, as well as being simple to link up with friends. There's no Wi-Fi, so you will have to plug the band in to sync it. But this does mean that the battery lasts twice as long as the others. The Fitbit Flex has Wi-Fi, so the app and website update automatically. Like the Jawbone, it makes connecting to friends pretty easy, has vibrate alarms and tracks sleep and various activities. I like that you can buy different coloured bands to mount the tracker in. It also does a jolly little vibrate to celebrate meeting your goal. The Nike Plus Fuel Band tracks steps and calories, but also uses its own fitness measure, fuel points, which don't actually relate to anything unless you want to compare your progress with the huge Nike Plus community, including celebrities and athletes. One big downside is that the app is only available on iPhone. The readout is pretty cool, though. Newcomer to the market, the Misfit Shine only launched a few months ago after crowdfunding on Indiegogo. When it comes to style, this tracker outshines the competition with a neat magnetic clip so you can fix it to anything and a range of alternative accessories. It's a bit short of features and only has an iPhone app, but it is early days yet and the way it syncs is pretty cool. It doesn't need recharging either as the coin cell battery is replaceable and supposed to last up to six months. I've really had to skim through the features as there is a lot more to all of these devices, but over the six week period that I road tested them, I found my preferences influenced most by two things. Where my friends were, so I could connect with them for motivation and goal sharing, and which third party apps were linkable to extend the features beyond just tracking. If you're choosing a device, then definitely ask around to see if any of your friends are using one too. When it comes to connected apps, the Jawbone and the Flex are streets ahead. Once connected, these apps share data so that you can see from your tracker dashboard exactly how you're progressing. And I'll be covering those apps in more detail next week. hugely popular adult-rated game GTA V might be making the headlines for its controversial storylines, but if you're not interested in bank robberies and other criminal activities, step back and check out the awesome scenery. As captured by this Flickr group, landscape photographers of Los Santos and Blaine County. The collection is filled with stunning screenshots taken by gamers using the free iFruit iOS app. Now shut up and drive. And in case you missed it, last month Google added an Android device manager to their handset suite, allowing you to locate your phone through a browser. Well, now they've added another great security feature, remote screen lock and restore factory settings for the worst case scenario. Kate Russell's Webscape. And if you missed those links, they're all up at our website as usual. bbc.co.uk slash click is the address you need. If you'd like to get in touch with us about anything you've seen today, feel free. The email address is click at bbc.co.uk. We're also knocking about on Facebook, Google Plus and Twitter too. That is it for now though. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.